uh, Graham Barker, uh, sem er Disney professor í fortlafræði emeritus hjá háskólanum í Cambridge. Og hann sónir er að hafa nú svona uh, hel helgast að því hvernig, hvernig landslag og, og sambart manns og, og náttúru hefur verið til. Hann, 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 hérna, hann er nú grafi víða. Hann er nú verið uh, að hluta til mikið í Líbi og gert að skráningu með hérna, David Mattingly þegar hann var hjá Lester. Og síðan er hann var líka verið það sem við getum kallað svona semi-arit umhverfi á Ítalíu. En hann ætlar að segja ykkur í dag frá, frá hellum sem er í, í austur að norðaustur hluta Líbíu. Þannig að ég, ég, ég er búin að vera að læra í nokkra daga að bera hellana fram en það, það er ómögulegt. <laughs> ég ætla bara að leifa greiðan Barker að gera það. Og hérna, take it away Barker, you're free to go. <laughs> Sorry for the nice landing. That's introduction, great. Um, yeah. Well, it's very nice to be invited. Um, I've never been to Iceland. My wife was just saying what a shame it was now because of Zoom. You know, we all do it um, with, without visiting. Anyway, it's, um, it's on one of my priority lists to visit. It's also very nice to be invited to talk. And um, you know, it's clearly something completely different from Icelandic archaeology. But I, I hope it's the kind of issues that we're facing that we're dealing with in this project. I, I hope they're interesting and useful. And you say it's called Living with Climate Change in North African Prehistory, and it's the archaeology of this cave that you can see here. It's called the Hauer Fatir, the great, the big cave. Um, why is that not? I just think why it's not moving ahead. Why is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yes, there was a, a big study um, published in 2014 by Kintai, Keith Kintai, and a whole range of American archaeologists. You can see the very well known figures uh, Henry Wright, Melinda Zader, Sabloff, and so on. And they looked at um, kind of what, what were the big challenges that archaeologists needed to address. And it was a fairly predictable range, I mean, you know, origins of things and urbanization and, and a whole series of, of kind of big issues that we needed to, that archaeologists needed to address um, in, in, you know, globally, the kind of big questions where we could contribute. And one particular one was all about climate change and archaeology, and that's how they put it, how do humans perceive and react to changes in climate and the natural environment over short and long terms. Um, and in this, um, I quoted there from a book called Climate Crisis in Human History, um, and two of the three editors, Robert Gignac and Claudia V. Finzi, they start off by saying that you know, we know that the climate of the earth is changing, we know that it's always changed, and you can see here we've got um, you know, the range of, of changes over millions of years, these are you know, in effect, I mean they're proxies for temperatures um, coming up to the present day. Um, and then here over the past million years, these are the marine isotope stages um, with colder, drier climates and, and warmer, more humid climates. And this is a zigzag tooth-like um, shape that we have. And if you then zero that down again to the past 300,000 years, which is sort of approximately the, the time scale that we think of for modern humans, the first modern humans um, found at Jebel Ehud in Morocco, a date around 300,000 years ago, which is kind of where the genetics also point to that sort of origins of, of Homo sapiens. So over that 300,000 years, again, you can see, um, you know, the, these, these are the marine isotope stages. We're in marine isotope stage one, the Holocene. And, um, and you can see um, there at nine, eight, seven, six. And again, this zigzag of world's climate with the beginnings of five, the temperature really became much more from, from really cold times and cold and dry through marine isotope stage six, a very, very sudden dramatic warming. And at the first part of five, it, it may even have been wet, it was wetter and more, and more humid and warmer than it is today. And then the zigzag down into the broad of the last ice age 
with, with zigzags all the way through and then the present day climatic warming. So this again, it's, it's reversing it the other way around, but this is the same from a hundred odd thousand years ago in MIS-5 and this zigzag, but sharp changes within it, but the broad trend to getting colder and drier, the last glacial maximum, and then the sudden warming up to today. So over the past 130,000 years, which is, which is broadly the, the last glacial cycle, the last interglacial, the last glacial, and the Holocene, MIS-1. And even over the past 2,000 years too, again, dramatic change. So we know, and of course, there's been, um, a long discussions about you know, why these things are, uh, why, why the various um, circle, I mean, the, the cyclical nature of, of many of these changes and so on. So we know the earth's changing, they say, and it's always changed. And they carry on to say the adaptive response of our ancestors has made us what we are, which again comes back to this question of Kintar, how have people responded to climate change and what can we learn from that? that's relevant to the present and the future. Um, and I think the simple stories about climate change explaining cultural change, they abound in the literature, both the popular literature and indeed the, the science literature, which says, you know, we have this event at 8.2 thousand years ago, and this happened, that happened in terms of nearly the Near East, and 4.2, 4,200 years ago, that's been identified with all sorts of um, state collapse um, in the in the Near East, Southwest Asia, and these ideas of you know that once upon a time this was a peopled landscape and now it's desert. That's in Libya. Or this idea, you know, past civilizations overwhelmed by by sand, by aridity, the Mesoamerican and the collapse book. Um, there's a you know, this common approach of climate change explains cultural change. And of course, there are other instances where we know these, like the wetter climates, um, the, the the main this main humid frame, that the Sahara, for example, in, in major times was, was had lakes and rivers in the Sahara Desert. Um, there are huge challenges in linking climate and people, um, because you know, we have this global knowledge or the knowledge of global climate change largely from the greenland ice cores and um cores taken in the ocean sediments and there, there are other boxes like that as well with long-term continuous records um so we we at the global scale we have that understanding but somehow you know what we're interested in is what's going on you know at the human scale um, you know, what, what was it like, climate change in Iceland, you know, in a thousand AD, whatever. We're trying to drill down from these global models to regional climate models to then the local understanding of landscape and then landscape and people to, to get, therefore, from these global climate models to local socioeconomic impacts and responses. And there was a very good article by um, um, in, in Nature about the Maya some years ago where where it was written by um, an archaeologist and a geographer. And they ended up saying one of the problems is that is the, the climate the change materials tend to get published in one set of journals and the archaeology in another set of journals, in fact, like ships passing in the night. Um, because as I said, we have these, the climate change effects were variable in time and space. So the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, uh, which was the, the coldest, driest, um, period of, of Homo sapiens um, around the Mediterranean. We know that it seems to be it seems to play out in rather different ways. So, the effects of climate change are variable in time and space. We will have to drill down from these global trends, where the finest data broadly is not where people are, large numbers, Greenland, and then and the ocean sediment, to get these local experiences. This is a really big issue in many instances, that these long-term records, the best records, are very often not where the best archaeological records are. And even if, so we then have to try to create our, our climate records geographically um, that we can tie to cultural, to archaeological, historical records, and, and demonstrating correlations between the two is normally is incredibly difficult, particularly because of the the nature of the, um, the dating methods that we're using. Um, so, so demonstrating that you know, this happened in terms of the 
climate environment or local landscape. And this happened in terms of um, cu cultural change. And then, of course, to move to causation is absolutely incredibly difficult. Just to pause a minute, make sure I plug my, my laptop in because it dies on us. So that's the background to this project that um, called the Cyrenaica Prehistory Project. And what we're talking about is we have the Mediterranean here. Modern Libya goes from this western part, which is Tripolitania. The eastern part is Cyrenaica. The southern part of this map is Fazan. And they really are three, in many ways, they've historically more often been separate than, than together. The, the, the main part of Cyrenaica, at the top here, you have what's called the Jebel Akhtar, the Green Mountain. It rises to 900 metres above sea level. You see the, the scale of it there, 300 by 100. And it gets the kind of rainfall that broadly the Mediterranean gets. So in many ways, the landscape of the Jebel Akhtar is, is more like the landscapes of Crete and southern Greece, because what you then have is, is desert very quickly further south. And this is the area we've been working in. The Halfatir cave is on the coast. There's a coastal plain which, which disappears. Out. We've got a set of escarpments here. But there's a, a littoral there. And then you come up onto the Jebel. You can see here, this is um, you know, a green landscape, pretty well watered, the same amount of water as, say, in the Mediterranean, uh, northern Mediterranean countries. And then very rapidly, over sort of 20, 30 kilometers, you move from that to the pre-desert and then out to the desert edge down here. So it's a very dramatic changing landscape. And you can see the half a tears on the top. It's a large dolly in cave. And this is the this is the standing up here. This is the view you have. This is the dolly now farm and, this, and the Mediterranean Sea is what, you know, a kilometer away. This is the view into the cave. That's a sorry to land crew to get a sense of the scale. And this is a helicopter view into the cave too. Um, it's really famous from excavations by Charles McBurney in the 1950s. He was a Cambridge prehistorian. And this is the dolly, this is the cave here. And he put a large trench over the years in, in the main part of the cave. And it was shaped, he, he stepped it down. So he had an upper trench, a middle trench, and a lower trench. And he went down 14 meters. This is this upper trench, and the middle trench is being excavated here. And these are the kind of drawings that he's published. Um, he had radiocarbon dating. This is, he hadn't got methods that we now have for periods older than radiocarbon dating, but he had these set of major phases that he found. And he used a European Paleolithic um, terminology, which was more common then. Um, but you can see he had a, a particular kind of middle Paleolithic, uh, two, two major types here, what he called preorignation and the Valois Mysterium. And then he had changed to blade industries. So he assumed that these were upper Paleolithic, assumed to be Homo sapiens, as in Europe. Um, there, there were two jaws found down here. And at the time in the European chronology, of course, middle Paleolithic is, is Neanderthal, upper Paleolithic is modern human. And they did what they, and McBurney actually thought they might be Neanderthaloid, but now we know Neanderthals weren't there and they were identified. Um, some years later by Jacques Houma is definitely modern human. So we have modern humans living there all the way through, making this middle Paleolithic technology, which in the African terminology is now middle stone age. And then, then there's a change to making this upper Paleolithic blade technology, and it carries on into a Mesolithic technology and the same sort of thing, but with um, Neolithic pottery and evidence for domestic sheep. So we had middle Paleolithic, upper Paleolithic, and the kind of late Paleolithic, and the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. He could date back to here, back to 40,000. So back here, he, he could only estimate. Um, and he thought that it might be, well, he thought if this was 40,000, he looked at the stratigraphies and thought this might go back to the 80,000 years ago. Um, so we returned to the cave starting in 2007. We re-excavated the cave, 
we did a lot of work in the landscape. We also did survey in the landscape. And we went back to the, the archive from all the McBurney materials because they're virtually all in Cambridge on long-term loan from the Libyan Antiquities Service. So what we did, he filled the hole up at the end. So we had to a 14 meter deep trench. So we found the trench. This is in the first couple of days here. You see the people sitting around. And gradually over the years, we go for about a month a year, we emptied the stratigraphy to get right down to the bottom. And we also cut, dug these small trenches, sort of two by one really, mostly. This one down the middle trench, we did one up in the top two one down here, D, all the way down at the back of his deep sounding. And then we also put another small trench in at the bottom, at the very bottom, down about 15 metres. And we got as many as we could of, of radiocarbon dates. We were able to get tephra. Um, uh, mostly um, these are things washing in from the Mediterranean, North Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and that's been hugely important for giving us dating signatures. OSL dating has been very effective, obviously allowing us to get them um, down because he could only date radiocarbon broadly down to there. So we've been able to get radiocarbon dates and OSL dates to there and OSL dates and others all the way down there. New series as well. And then we dug these sample columns down the side of his walls. We studied his walls and took as much dating. We dug these sample columns to get all the various sorts of sampling for dating and paleoenvironment, say pollen, phytolis. We did a lot of micromorphology. Um, and broadly, the overall sequence that we exposed fits the marine isotope stages, the global stages. So marine isotope stage five down here, these are these fine sediments formed in wetter, humid conditions. MIS-4, the climate was really oscillating between cold, between warm and humid, cold and dry, warm and humid, cold and dry. It's an oscillating climate in MIS-4, and we could pick that up in what we call fasces 4 And then broadly, it went on getting drier and drier and colder with episodes of, of short oscillations in between. But basically these upper deposits here consist almost entirely of shatter from the roof coming down in, in cold, dry conditions. And then there's a, a Holocene stratigraphy, which is increasingly dominated by signs of people um, keeping sheep and goats, for example, in the cave. So just to run quickly through what's emerged from that long sequence. First of all, the OSL dates show that at beginnings of occupation in the cave, it's not 80,000, it, it's, it's 100 and, um, well, it's 140,000 down at that very bottom. Um, so we're into what's called MIS-6, the end of it. But certainly we have a lot of information for MIS-5, this, this period when the, the, the world climate was um, warmer, than today and more humid. And we know that this is MI6. There was this dramatic change to 5E, and then D went back to more glacial conditions. C was a, another phase of, of um, humidity and, and so on, and warmth, um, and not as dramatic as, as E. Back again, B, glacial, another fluctuation like that, and then it went into um, MIS4. And you can see we've got a lot of our occupation evidence, both McBurney's and our own. These are the lithics down there. You can see these little occurrences through MIS-5. So that first period, it looks like we know at that time this was the Green Sahara. People could cross, move around the Sahara. There were lakes, there were rivers. So 300,000 is when we have these fossils up here in Morocco of modern humans. We've got modern humans clearly living here and able to to both occupy the coast and occupy the interior. Um, and so we've got people living up here at that time. These are our OSL dates and this evidence down the bottom of the cave for the significant use. And you see their mud flows interspersed with human occupation, which is what you, you see here. But just as the climate here, our main occupation in terms of the archeological evidence is in this period, people are there then, they are there then, but much less frequently. You get these little blips of artifacts coming on like so. So they were adapted, these, particularly in the beginning of this MIS-5, we've got modern humans well adapted to what were humid forested landscapes 
and to coastal resources. You can see they're hunting a, a, a wide range of animals, including that hartebeest that we can, and aurochs that we, we see in, in more wooded landscapes, gazelle and, and barbary sheep is the local wild animal that's barbary sheep is more adapted to um, more rockier landscapes, but often cold and drier. They were fishing at this time. And we've got the kind of offshore species that must have been caught. Um, they couldn't be caught by line from the shore or by baskets or whatever. Somehow people have, have got the technologies to get off the shore and fish there. Lots of shellfish, lots of crabs being brought up to the cave from the shore. The shore um, in, in these periods, although you'll know that um, in the glacial periods, the, the seas um, it, um, it retreated as the glaciers expanded um, and, and oceans levels in some places changed dramatically like New Britain was, was cut off and then linked to the continent, cut off again. Um, but in the case of here, that this particular coast of North Africa is, is very steep and it's not very much affected by, by the, the, in other words, there wasn't a big plain opened out in front of the cave. Land snails were collected intensively. People were collecting plants. We've got bone points, technologies, all of which seem for modern humans. They were collecting these seashells and land, and land snails to dig out meat. And they were also making, there are little signs of symbolism going with these archaic humans, like these perforated shell beads. And this is these people making these, um, straight what he called pre origination lithics. So people are there then. We then have these, you saw these, these people hardly there, hardly present, coming back with small amounts, no presence, back again, fluctuating to MIS-5. When we get into MIS-4, this is this period of really oscillating climates when the world's climates were moving from these MIS-5 broadly wet and humid to these much colder, more arid climates with these distinct fluctuations. And this is the period of this Lavalois Mousterian, his second phase of Middle Paleolithic. Um, people are there. This is when the mandibles, the, the human mandibles that he found, are in one of these wetter phases. They're burning grass. It's not clear why, but the argument is perhaps they're bringing bedding into the cave. We've got hearths down here too, like that. Um, but what is odd is there's it, it does look like that there are oscillating climates um, and frequent abandonments. So it, whereas there's this tiny presence of the in MIS-5 in those colder periods with people with those pre ordination technologies, when we get into this phase using these standard flake Middle Stone Age technologies, it looks like people are largely there in these wet phases as if, as if it, you know, the, the, well, we can't say, but they're not, they're not present in the cave. Of course, we have the problems, are they present you know, in other caves down the road? Are they abandoning the whole of the Jebel Akhtar? We don't know. But certainly, if you like, they've got technologies which are well adapted to these sorts of environments. We don't find people then, and then we'll find them back again here and then not then, and back again, and then. So we're getting a much finer handle on the, um, on the presence of humans and what they're doing than, was, uh, than was, Bernie was able to have. Um, as we move into MIS-3, this was now getting into a global trend to increasing aridity. There were those sharp fluctuations. I remember these, those climate changes, they're zigzagging through. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not just a, a uniform colder dry, but the overall trend was to colder and drier. And at this time, about 45,000, this very different blade industry, actually in some ways a bit like that pre-orignation, but heavy blades appear. And people have often argued, I mean, um, McBurney thought it was the basic Upper Paleolithic, but many people have said, Kind of it, it is, but in terms of Middle Stone Age, Late Stone Age, the Late Stone Age is really the much later blade industry. So it's simply kind of a it's a very early blade industry, about forty five thousand, um, but only for about five thousand years, and then the cave appears to be more or less entirely abandoned. Again, things like the mollusks show this presence, and then people disappearing. So early Dabon, there they are with all this material. Um, the, 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 there appears to be interdigitation. The, the, the key layer that McBurney 
excavated, covering the transition from these Middle Stone Age, well, Mousterian to Dabon, flake to blade industries, was a big layer. I mean, it was, I think it was 20, 30 um, inches, something like that, or no, um, only 30, 40 centimeters. Um, and he and he had the suspicion that he had mixed things because he did he did say he he found mixed deposits Lavalois, Mustoon, and Dabon together, and he did have a sense that he might have mixed. If you read carefully, you can see he's not entirely clear whether they were like they're they're there from mixing. From our very detailed stratigraphies in those trenches that we dug down the side of his, there's just the hints of interdigitation that you get those wet, wetter phases and there are those classic Mousterian flakes in, and then it flips to a first of one of those colder oscillations and drier, and people are there with these dab and blade industries. Then it flips back and we get flake industries, all tiny numbers, so you know, it's very difficult to argue, but it does look like technologies are, are well, there are different sorts of technologies, these mysterious ones that are, re, that are geared to these preceding climates and the Dabin ones that are geared to the drier climates that are going to develop, but at this critical time, they're interdigitating. Um, we've done quite a lot of work on microware and you can see they've got new technologies now, this Dabin, there's impact damage, hafting marks, fiber binding. So it looks like they've, they've got some kind of projectile technologies. And presumably, as the landscape gets more open, people are developing. They may not have been the bow and arrow, they've certainly got projectiles, and they're increasingly focusing on these extremely agile animals of the rocky and more arid open slopes above the cave. So increasing aridity, new adaptations. But periods when um, people just disappear from the record. Um, MIS2, it was really uh, significantly cold and dry now. Um, 29,000 um, 20, is, is the maximum of gold conditions. And what we've got is, again, late Dabon, people have come back into the cave four or 5,000 years after this big gap. And they've got those blade technologies, Dabon technologies. But they've also got, we've got evidence like this, grindstones, which have got fragments of nuts and grasses on the residues. So people are beginning to develop much better ways of using the plants that are increasingly presumably using the, the, the arid zone landscapes for all that they're worth. And interesting, and it's an increasing emphasis on plant foods. And we've got post holes from this period. That's one of them there. Um, and, and other sort of halves. And with, with the halves, these structures, we don't know what, why inside the cave they're putting these posts around where they're cooking um, or nearby and say, we, we just don't know what they are. Processing some kind of food, are they drying meat? We don't know. But they're, they're this living evidence in the cave in this period. And you can see what the mo mo deposits are mostly like. This is these earlier, more humid periods, and then just rock, 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 really cold and dry landscapes. And then the last phase of the, um, the Pleistocene is in with its MIS-2, 20,000 again, the, the technologies change from those late dab, and they, but it's a marginal change. They're really the same sorts of small blade industries. We have the same things of, of, their, of you know, arrow or spear, well, projectile technologies, the same sort of evidence as before. But people seem to have really kind of in this coldest, driest period, we seem to have the most intensive use of the cave and evidence for people there all year round in terms of the animals they're hunting, all the year round in terms of the shellfish they're collecting. And this is from isotope studies. And they're collecting a whole range of plant food, plant gathering and processing. And we've got evidence for storage in the cave for pine kernels being stored in the cave, hazelnuts being stored. So and technologies are being developed for living in these um, more open arid landscapes. And we would assume that they'd be much more um, mobile, but we're trying to contrast that at the moment, but with these evidence that, that you know, if, if not, people may not be living there all of the year, but people are certainly visiting the cave at this time in all the major phases. 
Let me move into the Holocene and the climate switched back to another of these green Sahara phases like it was in MIS-5E. So from 12,000 to 8,200, we have a landscape, you see down here, we're up here, and evidence is that hunter-gatherers were able to expand from being just on the edges here and here and down in the Sahel. The whole of the Sahara is peopled by hunter-gatherers at this sort of time over these, and this is the period of, of, of the rock art that you find in the Sahara. And, and from the Halfetir and from other caves that we've excavated nearby, we've got this seasonal hunting of Barbary sheep and gazelle. They're collecting um, summer plants and, and spring plants. They're winter fishing. So it's a kind of version of, um, of what was happening before, but adapted now to, to much more much more humid climates, you know, woodland resources and so on. So the technologies are kept and developed for living in these, these more forested landscapes, but also making use of them as the coastal as long, long before. And then from 8,200 to 400, this is when the North Africans climate in the Sahara, you really did get aridification. Um, and it's a period when you do get the first evidence of pastoralism in the Sahara. And we also get the same pre-existing system, plant gathering, hunting, fishing, gathering, and we've got sheep and goats, domestic goats appearing just after this period as the, as the, the climate really starts to get arid and, and there's pottery. We have no evidence of cereal cultivation until really much later, and that's pretty much the, a common story right across into northwest Africa, the, the Maghreb. There's a lot of evidence that sheep and goat are taken up by the hunter-gatherers at this sort of time, and people argue, did they were these animals spread west by land or, or by sea along North Africa? Or, in the terms of the Maghreb, this is Algeria and so on, whether and Algeria, Morocco, or whether they came across from Spain. Um, and we don't get, we can see that it's not until we, the, it's about the time of the Greek settlers that came about 1000 BC, um, the Greek colonies were a bit later, but the Phoenicians and then the Greeks, that we can finally see in the pollen record the Mediterranean landscape that there is today. So just to conclude on this overall story, you can see this is the, the, the fauna from the McBurney archive, and just giving a, a broad sense through that 130, 40,000 years of how the cave is being occupied. And these are just the fragments, numbers, of, of animal bones that are being you know, used for fauna, and then these big fluctuations and really the major periods at the end. So most intensive use in MIS 5E, right down here where we've got the evidence that he hasn't got, most intensive use, and then after the last glacial maximum, mostly low intensity use, these long periods of abandonment that this, this doesn't show, but what we've seen from, the, from our stratigraphy is, although this is a kind of blurring, what we can see from the sediments is there are very sediments and the, the detailed studies of the archaeology going with them. There are these long periods of abandonment for thousands and thousands of years when there's just no human presence as far as we can see. So there is evidence of these Middle Stone Age extinctions at the end of the pre-origination and the end uh, and seem to be related to aridity. So there's some sort of hints that there were times when people simply weren't able to function with the technologies they've got and say we don't know whether it's just the cave or the our part of the Jebel Akhtar or whether the whole of the Jebel Akhtar is just you know it's not possible to live in it um, and then this evidence of these successful adaptations to aridity uh, especially the last glacial maximum so said in the end it's a, a complex story of successes and failures one of the the weaknesses of the project is we haven't got the really fine climatic detail. We've got pollen records, sediment records, and molluscan records. But the work we've been doing in um, Shanidar Cave, following on this project in Iraq, this is a cave which has got Neanderthals and then modern humans. And for example, there we've got a really good sample of microfauna, which we haven't really got in our cave, apart from right down the bottom in the MIS-5 levels. And so a PhD student at Cambridge has tracked um, local landscape change from the microfauna, because this is what these are, is little rodents that are being caught by owls and eagles and so on in 10, 20 kilometres from the cave. So it's basically telling us the changing fauna about the changing landscape. And what she's been able to show 
is, for example, as it starts to get into these drier climates, the Neanderthals and then the modern humans using the cave, they're, they're, they're dropping into the cave in Shanidar in short periods when the climate flips back just for a, a couple of centuries sometimes. It flips back to more amenable climates and then goes back. And so these small scale differences um, are not, they're not picked up by the other proxies, which we have, the, the climate proxies in, in the Shanidar cave. Um, and we've only got those climate proxies really uh, in, in the half a tier. So you know, it is a complex story of success and failure, um, but we're, you know, we're faced with some of those problems as some of the you know, the climate data and the, and the people data. Sometimes it's really rich together and sometimes it's not. So it's, a, it's a classic problem of trying to you know, address you know, what, um, the successes and failures. But at least for all its weaknesses, I think it's a more complex story than often we do get to these stories of um, how people adapted in, in the past. And so a huge amount of people have been involved in this project. And that's just acknowledgements like so. Um, and it is a unit unique. There's talk about inscribing it as a World Heritage Site, not on its own, but the, um, the Greek colony of um, Cyrene is about half an hour inland from the cave, half an hour drive. And, um, and the Greek settlement of Apollonia is the, and is, was the, um, the port of Cyrene. And so there's, there's talk of, of how possibly therefore to include this as part of that World Heritage Site. Okay. Yeah. Okay, th thank you very much, Graham. That was uh, very interesting and very 